Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to part two here of the French Revolution by Oversimplified. So far, an absolutely fantastic video. We're in part six or seven or something like this in the France Country series. And yeah, part one was great. I really, really enjoyed it. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Um, hopefully the lighting today is a little bit better. I'm recording this right in the morning. So there's nice bright light. Hopefully it doesn't look like a horror movie or anything like that. The last one, the lighting was a little dark. So hope that's all corrected. Nothing else to add here. Thank you very much for joining me so far. If you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Let's get into it. King Louis and his family were now in the Tuileries Palace in Paris, where for the next couple of years, he watched as the revolutionary government began to strip away his power. And yep. fearing for his safety, he had to stay on their good side. Hey, look who it is. It's my favorite revolutionaries. Yep, I'm your number one fan. What can I do for you? Hey, King Louis, so we've made a few decisions. First, all of your friends in the nobility are gonna have to pay taxes the same as everyone else. Great idea. I love it. And as a side note, the tax money can no longer pay for all your lavish parties. Great. I hate those parties. They're so awkward. And also, we're taking away your Porsche. Oh, come on! I mean... Yay. The king continually <laughs> found demand after... And so not even that. So at this point, actually, Louis is not the king of France, but rather the king of the French, which is a huge difference because he's basically a constitutional monarch. He has practically no power at this point. And spoiler alert for what happens, um, I won't spoil it, we'll go along there, but yeah, to say that he never had any sort of vestige of power anymore past this point. To demand being made of him to prove his support for the revolution. On one occasion, a mob would invade the palace and demand he wear the revolutionary bonnet. This is the face of a man who is definitely pretending he wants to wear that bonnet. Now around here, I want to mention that one thing King Louis had a problem with was people constantly raiding his palace. But one thing he didn't have a problem with was raiding noobs on this video's sponsor, oh, Raid Shadow Legends. Nice. Raid, Sh Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, if you don't know what Raid Shadow Legends is, I, pff, I don't even know what to tell you. The situation rapidly turning against him, the king decided it might be a good idea to leave France and mount a campaign to retake his country from abroad. Luckily for him, he was married to an Austrian. So on the night of June 20th, 1791, the king and his family disguised themselves as servants and attempted to flee to the Austrian Netherlands. The royal carriage made a stop in the town of Varennes, and the postmaster there was like, hey guys, what's up? Where are you off to? We are but a collection of inconspicuous servants heading for the border for no particular reason at all. <laughs> Say, you, the fat one, you look kind of familiar. Aren't you the king? Nope. Let me see your passport. It says here you're King Louis the Sixteenth. Nope, not me. Take him away, boys. The king was promptly returned to Paris, but now the jig was up. His lack of support for the revolution was clear to all, and many considered him a straight-up traitor who tried to abandon his people. As a result, the new constitution of 1791 completely reduced his powers to that of a simple figurehead, a constitutional monarch. Yep. However, radicals, such as those in the Jacobin Club, were outraged that the king wasn't to be removed entirely. So a month later, these radicals staged a protest on the Champ du Mars, calling for the king's removal. The government of Paris feared an insurrection was mounting, and they sent the military to disperse the crowd. The confrontation escalated and resulted in the Revolutionary National Guard firing on a crowd of revolutionaries. You heard that right, right? The revolution, which is supposed to be for the people and for everyone who is pro-revolution, is now firing on those who, you know, who are a part of the revolution. And what's just so interesting is just how this really did repeat during the Russian Revolution as well, where after the Bolsheviks, you know, they go and take power. There's obviously repression even from those who are siding with the Bolsheviks, right? Or those who sided with the Mensheviks, where they had their ideological disagreements between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, but they were still pro-revolution. They were against the Tsar. They wanted to overthrow the system. Yeah, it's just, it's funny how this always, you know, not with every revolution. I was looking up some more peaceful revolutions last night. There were way more than I thought there was. There was Mongolia in 1990. Almost all the post-Soviet countries had it. 1986 in the Philippines. But anyways, it's funny how a lot of revolutions end up this way, how violence just besieges more violence. It was a massacre. The incident exposed a deep division within the Brotherhood of the Revolution. Yeah. On one side, the moderates who wanted to keep the king as a figurehead. On the other, 
Radicals who wanted to see the king deposed and heads roll. In the wake of the massacre, these radicals received a wave of support. It's a spoiler, and by speaking the way. Heads of rolling rolling. heads, one form of equality the revolution there you introduced go. <laughs> was equality in execution. This meant no more torturous drawing and quartering, no more inhumane hanging. They wanted all criminals, regardless of economic status, to receive the same penalty, a quick and painless one. Luckily, a man by the name of Dr. Joseph Guillotine had an yep. idea. A heavy blade that falls like thunder, the head flies off, blood spurts, and the man is no more. The guillotine, otherwise known as the National Razor. The guillotine made its debut in 1791 as the new form of execution. The writings of Marat and others continued to call for the execution of anyone suspected of working against the revolution. For him, this included some members of the clergy and nobility who had previously benefited from the cruel system of inequality that existed before the revolution. In many parts of the countryside, local lords had found themselves become a target. Sire, the peasants, they're revolting. Oh, come on, that's a bit harsh. Sure, they smell a bit, but I wouldn't say they're revolting. <laughs> oh, yes, I see what you yeah. mean. Increasingly, these French aristocrats began fleeing France to find solitude in other parts of Europe. And once again, fear began to take hold. The privileged classes of these foreign nations didn't like what they were seeing because they feared revolutionary ideas may spread to their own lands. The National Assembly, actually now the Legislative Assembly, feared that these nations may decide to attack. Then why don't we attack them first? No, you idiots. We are definitely not ready for war yet. Did somebody say something? France declared war in Austria in April 1792 and immediately got pummeled. It also didn't help that Austria's ally, Prussia, joined in the fighting. The Prussian Duke of Brunswick posted a letter warning the... Yeah, and, and Prussia was at this time always always an opportunistic country, a very clever country, always looking to expand its, its borders at this point. And while there was tension between Prussia and Austria, um, during this meeting with the Duke of Brunswick, they were actually discussing the partition of Poland as well, which maybe we'll get into that in a Polish country series. But yeah, it was sort of an unlikely-ish ally at the time. Revolutionaries that if anything happened to the king, he would burn Paris to the ground. The Duke's letter proved to be a massive success in inspiring the people of Paris to do the exact opposite yep. of what he intended. They were enraged by the threat, and on the 10th of August, 1792, the tension in the city exploded, and a mob stormed the king's palace. Fighting broke out between the revolutionaries and the king's Swiss guard, with casualties in the hundreds. King Louis fled and took refuge in the chamber of the Legislative Assembly, where Robespierre and his radical Jacobins were gaining ever more power. Given the developing situation, the chamber decided to hold a vote. And in what some considered to be a second revolution, it was decided to suspend the monarchy entirely. King Louis XVI was now just plain old Louis, and he was sent to a prison cell where an eye could be kept on him. A month later, the newly established National Convention officially declared the French Republic, and society underwent a massive change. Enlightened ideas of democracy and equality were being implemented, but very quickly, these ideas seemed to become secondary to fear, paranoia, and a thirst for blood the yep. new republic exactly and so when things change so quickly like this and we see this time and time again right through radical social changes is that the fear that comes with it right that's what really creates you know sometimes it creates power vacuums it creates paranoia where in this case spoilers again we'll get to the, the terror right in the russian revolution there was a state-sponsored red terror there was the bolshevik terror and then, I mean, even even Bolshevik terrors that would roll over into Europe as well into other nations that were very, very, you know, fearful of communism. And that also led to various right wing governments and then suspension of liberties and then enemies of the state. It just it's the snowball effect. It always snowballs like this. It began working to violently remove any semblance of the old royalist regime. The yeah. church became a prime target. Priests who refused to take an oath to the revolution were deported or arrested. A new state-sponsored atheistic religion named the Cult of Reason was created as a replacement for the Catholic Church. Notre Dame, along with many other churches, had their religious treasures destroyed and were converted shame, actually. to temples of reason. Even the Christian calendar didn't survive, as a brand new revolutionary calendar was soon introduced. Hey, honey. See, one thing I'm curious about, though, is that as we learned in the French Wars of Religion, the Catholic Church would basically go on to be the dominant place where being French meant being Catholic. So I'm curious of like the religious minorities that were living in France at this time, um, specifically Protestants themselves, who, while the French wars of religion at this point were not in living memory, they were obviously known about and they would have been they would have been spoken about and there would have been generational, I don't want to use the word trauma, but generational understanding 
of what the French Wars of Religion were, I wonder what they thought of this happening, where basically the Catholic Church and the government fell at the same time, and what sort of their response to that was. I mean, were they also against it that they think, you know, maybe it was too far? I don't know. I'm actually kind of curious on that. If you do know the answer, let me know in the comments below. I'm home. Yeah, whatever, jerk. Whoa, what's wrong with you? You forgot. Forgot what? Everything. This entire year. My birthday was on the 3rd of Germinal. Our anniversary was the 12th of Thermidor. And you promised that in Freimare, we'd go on a romantic weekend trip to Venice. No, I said we'd do that in December. December hasn't been a thing for years. The government of Paris, now under the control of the radical saint culotte, began rounding up suspected enemies of the revolution and sending them to prison in the thousands. Yes. Naturally, a large number of those arrested were members of the clergy and aristocracy. As France's foreign enemies continued to close in, panic spread. Georges yep. Danton made impassioned calls for men to defend the Republic and tens of thousands of troops left Paris for the front lines. However, in their absence, Paris was left to its own devices. And As any troops arrived too. in Verdun, the people of Paris feared that their crowded prisons were becoming a breeding ground for counter-revolutionary conspiracy. What would happen if the Prussians reached Paris and freed the aristocrats? Marat believed he knew what would happen. The aristocrats would enact their vengeance on the people. Fearing those they had already imprisoned, mobs descended on Paris's prisons. They broke in, and during the brutal September massacres, yeah. aristocrats, priests, and others were tried and executed on the spot. Even women and children weren't spared. With over 1,600 victims, word of the massacre spread across Europe. One British newspaper wondered, are these the rights of man? Is this the liberty of human nature? But and that's such a really great quote too, right? The revolution is meant to be for you know egalitarianism and to enhance the rights of men. Though obviously, you know, as he said in the first part, gender inequality aside. Um, and then it just ends up like this, right? And it's just, it also reminds me again of the Russian Revolution where the, 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 um, the aristocratic people, they're, they're basically, if they're not on the side of the whites, they're also persecuted and killed. Um, this would obviously come later with the Kulaks as well. And, you know, the Romanov family themselves, right? Tsar Nicholas II, the fact that he's shot in his entire family is shot in a basement, right? Um, yeah, just always, it's, it's sad. But there was still one man in particular that Robespierre and his radicals really wanted to see executed. Austria and Prussia pledged that after they defeated France, they'd return King Louis to the throne. Well, checkmate Austria and Prussia, because you can't return a man to the throne if, if he's, he's dead. already dead. Citizen yep. Louis Capet was put on trial for treason. Obviously, he was found guilty, but his punishment was less certain. Many moderates wanted to simply deport him, but Robespierre insisted the revolution could only live if the king was, was dead. dead. A vote was held, and by just one vote, Louis was sentenced to the guillotine. Yeah, if crazy. you don't mind, I'd like to say if you imagine words. what would have happened if it Gentlemen, one vote one the other way. I am innocent of everything of which I am accused. Wait, you're too loud. They can't hear me. Hang on, I haven't finished yet. Wait, dude. Uncool. In her prison cell, Marie Antoinette heard the guns fire, signaling her yeah. husband's death. Before long, she would meet the same fate. Back on the war front, France defied all expectations and actually managed to push the enemy back. But then more countries joined the coalition against France and it all went to pot again. What do we do? Conscript the masses. The National Convention introduced a conscription Which is also going to make them with upset. each regional department having to meet a certain quota of men for the army. However, not everyone was happy with this new law. You see, while Paris was definitely a hotbed for radical revolutionary fervor, some of the regions outside of Paris weren't quite so keen on the revolution. Some were largely still conservative, still supported the church, and just didn't suffer from that much inequality before the revolution. So as the revolution turned increasingly violent and anti-Christian, many were outraged. Exactly. Now, they were being conscripted to fight for the new republic they hated. That was the last straw. Counter-revolutionary uprisings erupted in a number of regions across France. Some would last for years, such as in the Northwest, where a large-scale uprising was led by the Owls. Why were they called the Owls? Because their leader okay. was named John Owl. Why was he called John Owl? Possibly because he could do a really good impression of an owl. Really? That's what we're going with? Owls? Just because this guy can do an impression of one? Hit him with it, John. Hoot hoot. Yeah, okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> the Shrinery Uprising lasted all the way until 1800. In the summer of 1793, okay, sure. the southern city of Toulon invited ah, yes. the British Navy over Napoleon. for some tea and crumpets. 
and then they asked if they'd possibly like to stay and occupy the city. Being an important naval base, this was a heavy blow to the Republic, who sent a relatively unknown young captain by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte yep. to help stage the siege of the city. Toulon was recaptured by France in the winter, and for his service, Napoleon was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. The most infamous counter-revolution, however, occurred in the Vendée region. Throughout 1793, revolutionary forces clashed with the region's Catholic and Royal Army. The Republic defeated the counter-revolution through cruel pacification. In particular, General Jean-Baptiste Carrier committed brutal yeah. atrocities. Yeah. In one instance, he had thousands of civilians, priests, women and children tied to ships, which were then sunk. Yeah. Carrier would later be found guilty of war crimes and executed. Back in Paris, the government was still dominated by moderates. With the war going badly, revolts in the provinces, and the economy getting worse, it seemed the government just wasn't doing a very good job. Radicals' fear for the safety of the revolution intensified, and Marat even began calling for the moderates in the government to be executed. In return, the moderates called for the arrest of Marat. This led to a chain of events with the two sides in heated conflict. Robespierre declared the Jacobins to be an insurrection. Right? It's funny when you have the revolutionaries who are already radical, and then you have the radicals within the radical revolutionary, and it just spins out of control like that. Right? Uh, just, uh, yeah, just so interesting how that happens. You have the, the radicals, then the radicals within the radicals, and you got to wonder who's the radicals within the radicals within the radicals. Anyways and called on the people to arm themselves. It all ended on the 31st of May, 1793, with the National Convention surrounded by radical sans-culottes and 29 moderate Girondin politicians arrested. From this moment on, the moderates ceased to be a political force. Things are going to get way more radicals violent. would be in almost total control yep. of the government. And this brings us to the story of a woman named Charlotte Corday. Mm. Charlotte lived in the northwest city of Caen, and like many in the area, was horrified at the rapid radicalization and increasing violence of the revolution. And the man she blamed more than anyone was Jean-Paul Marat. She yep. wanted to bring peace back to France, and so she did something drastic. She traveled to Paris and told Marat she had a list of enemies for him to publish in his paper. Marat eagerly invited her in for a meeting. So where's that list of enemies you promised me? Here it is. Wait a minute. This isn't the list of enemies. It just says Yippie Kaye, mother. <laughs> and just like that, Marat was no more. Yeah. Charlotte was quickly arrested and sent to the guillotine. Her dream of restoring peace, however, died with her. Marat became a martyr. In Temples of Reason, symbols of the dead Marat became the new crucifix. In death, he became an even more powerful inspiration for the extreme levels of violence that were about to rip throughout the new republic. And that's right. Here comes the reign of terror. Yep. If you thought this revolution already sounds pretty violent, well, you ain't seen nothing yet, son. The radicals were now in control, and they believed not only was France surrounded by foreign enemies, but that within the masses, there were also plenty of internal ones too. Sound familiar? Individuals not loyal to the revolution, conspiring to bring about its downfall. Robespierre and the rest of the radical faction were having none of it. A new committee of public safety was established with 12 members. Its purpose was to protect... So take that in for a second. The committee of public safety that was commissioned for the safety of the public, right? Uh, yeah, the sure. French we'll Republic from its enemies, and it basically became a 12-man dictatorship with Robespierre as its leading voice. The Revolutionary Tribunal was also reinstated. A special court created to streamline the process of trying suspected enemies and handing out their death sentences. With these two new institutions, Robespierre <laughs> wanted to scare France's enemies straight. In September 1793, it was announced that terror would be the order of the day. In other words, fear had become official government policy. And from then onwards, we enter into the period known as the Reign of Terror. Spies and secret police were everywhere and watched the people closely. France's public had to be extremely careful what they said and how they behaved. Obviously, criticizing this new system or the government would quickly have you sent off to the guillotine. But that's not all. Even the most minor offense could have you tried before the Revolutionary Tribunal. Hello, Citizen Martin. Hello, Monsieur Dubois. Monsieur? Did I just hear you say Monsieur? That's the old style of address, my friend. To the guillotine! You know yeah. what? I didn't like him, but I do feel kind of bad for the king and his family. Oh, that's a no-no. Expressing sympathy for the royal family, are we? To the guillotine! 12 sous for a loaf of bread? That's way overpriced. To the guillotine! Man, this bread line is taking forever. To the guillotine! And you. You look like you're thinking anti-revolutionary thoughts. To the guillotine. 
Max, we're sending way too many people to the guillotine. To the guillotine! Chop, 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 chop. It was insane. All across France, about 40,000 people were killed for suspected crimes against liberty. 40,000 people, think about that, right? And you have to think of what this obviously does to society in and of itself. This just creates more fear, more paranoia. And then you have people turning against themselves, which, you know, during the, the Red Terror, during Stalin's time, while the numbers, it was way more than 40,000. I think it was around a million and a half people, right? People were waiting for the knock at the door, right? In the night when you would be taken away um, by the secret police. And so you can only imagine that there already, there's this, there's this fear sitting around in, in Paris and in other parts of the country. And now people are turning against each other, even for the most mundane things. And, you know, you can only imagine the atmosphere that's happening at this time and how, yeah, how much worse things can really get. Let's say your neighbor won't stop mowing the lawn at 7 in the morning. Well, then all you got to do is tell the government they've been talking smack about the revolution. Yep. And there's a good chance they'll end up exactly. in front of the Revolutionary Tribunal. Maybe they'll even be executed, taking a metaphorical load off your shoulders and a literal one off theirs. The most prominent victim of the reign of terror was a certain Marie Antoinette, who was finally tried and found guilty of treason <laughs> in 1793. Nice. She expected she'd be brought to the guillotine in a royal carriage, fit for a queen. All the Republic could provide for her, however, was a wooden tumbrel. Yeah, and so King Louis, I, I don't, no, he didn't, he didn't mention this? No, he didn't mention this. So Lu King Louis was, was brought in the royal carriage to his execution, right? And he was, you know, it was sort of a, I guess as respectful the, as, as an execution can be. But Marie Antoinette here, she's riding in basically an open cart that's meant for, you know, agriculture through the city where she's also being taunted by the people. And it's like, it was not a very dignified way of, 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 of dying, right? Especially for one that was a queen, basically. At 37 years old, the most yeah. hated woman in French history, met her end on the 16th of October, 1793. And the other funny thing too, her last words were, um, she apologized to the executioner because she stepped on his foot. So yeah, those were her last words. Robespierre had saved the revolution through terror. Internal dissent was being suppressed. The food situation was no longer quite as bad. Even the French military had got its act together again and pummeled the allies at the Battle of Fleurus. For Danton and his followers, the time was right to try to normalize the French Republic. Hey, Robes P. So we were thinking that since things are finally going better, maybe we should rein in the terror. And while we're on it, we could possibly start taking it easier on the church and also try to end this costly war. Hmm. Oh, crap. As time went on, Robes Pierre seemed to go, for lack of a better term, a bit mental. Yeah, and Dayton, you got to think, right? This is one of the original revolutionaries, right? One of the people that was so influential in the revolution itself, now he's been executed by who is now the leading figure, right? Robespierre. And so, yeah, just, it just sort of shows how quickly these things can collapse on each other, right? Sometimes um, it reminds me of sort of a snake eating its own tail, a little bit of a personal thing, but... Um, a friend of mine was very much involved in in the uh, in vegan activism, and what she was telling me is that during these um, you know within some of these groups, it's sort of the snake eating itself, where people that are already trying to support the same thing they start infighting. There's different ways that that some people think that they should take the cause. There's other different ways that people think they should take the cause, and then it just cycles and it becomes a snake eating its own tail. He was hell-bent on creating what he called a republic of virtue. And for him, this meant amping up the bloodshed even more. Yeah. Throughout the spring and summer of 1794, executions reached an unprecedented level during a period known as the Great Terror. Even those closest to him found their way to the guillotine if they dared oppose his ideas and actions. And he began alienating himself from the rest of the convention. He created a new deistic religion called the Cult of the Supreme Being. No. along with the new annual Festival of the Supreme Being. Man, I think Robespierre is really starting to lose it. He thinks he's a god or something. Nonsense. Sure, he's gone a little extreme, but he doesn't think he's a god. My children, bathe your immortal souls in the virtue of my republic. Okay, yeah, he's completely lost. <laughs> Robespierre's <laughs> ultimate mistake, however, came on July 26th, when he made a speech to the National Convention, in which he said this, I have in my hand a brand new list of enemies to be sent to the guillotine, and many of you are on this list, but I'm not going to tell you who yet. What do you think of that? 
I think we should send Robespierre to the guillotine first. All in favor? There you go. Oh, no. Two days later, Robespierre became the final victim of the monstrous terror and paranoia he had created. I'm kind of curious, actually, what is the sort of contemporary understanding of Robespierre? Is he sort of seen as basically a dictator, one who brought on a lot of violence to France? Or do people sort of look at his ideas of enlightenment, of enlightenment that he wanted to bring out in French society? You know, I'm kind of curious of what the modern judgment of Robespierre is. I, I don't know too much about that, sort of how historians see it or sort of how, yeah, maybe, maybe philosophers see him. I don't know. Many historical accounts of the revolution end here with the death of Robespierre and his terror. But the revolution officially continued for another yeah, we haven't five even years gotten to until Napoleon. 1799. So what happened between now and then? Well, after the fall of Robespierre, a more moderate political group called the Thermidorians took control of the convention. They wanted to restore stability to the government. Now, Robespierre's allies and other radicals who had fueled the terror themselves became Turning the target on of political suppression. Bourgeois street fighters took on the radical saint culotte in the streets during a period named the White Terror. In 1795, the Thermidorians drafted a new constitution and created a government called the Directory with the purpose of preventing power from being able to fall into the hands of a single individual again. As this new government Spoilers. was being established, royalists who wanted to bring the monarchy back to France saw this moment as an opportunity to strike. They staged an insurrection in Paris and battled with the National Guard in the streets. Luckily, one Napoleon Bonaparte happened to be in Paris at the time, and he took control of the situation, firing on the crowd and putting down the insurrection. From this moment on, the people of Paris would never again be able to stage a popular uprising and lost their control over the revolution. For his Does he mean ever again? I guess, okay, within the French Revolution, yes, no, they wouldn't have the chance to, but I mean, the Paris Commune, that was also up. He probably just means within the French Revolution. Trust me, this would not be the last time that the people of Paris would stand up against the government. Oof, not even close. His actions, Napoleon became a general and was sent to take control of the French armies in Italy. The new directory remained a fairly ineffective government for the remainder of the revolution. It was plagued with corruption and struggled to keep the economy afloat, and as a result, wasn't very popular. For the people of France, with the strict social customs of both royalist France and the tarragon, they didn't really know what to do with themselves. Men no longer removed their hats when talking to women, different classes began intermingling, and a publication began circulating that looked a lot like a modern dating app. It what? was social anarchy. Outside of France, the war continued. That's cool. In 1795, France took the Netherlands, where they set up a puppet state. Then they negotiated both Prussia and Spain out of the war. The British attempted to land French royalists in the west to reinforce rebellion, but that plan failed. In 1796, the French planned a three-pronged attack with the aim of marching on Vienna and knocking Austria out of the war. The two northern armies were defeated and forced to retreat. However, ah, yes. Napoleon in the south, with groundbreaking military strategy, won battle after battle after battle. He pushed the Austrians out of Italy and began closing in on Vienna. The Austrians freaked out and Napoleon oversaw the signing of a peace treaty. He had almost single-handedly knocked Austria out of the war. And by the way, he was only 28. So maybe it's about time you moved out of your mom's basement. <laughs> Napoleon became a famed hero among the French yep. people, but his aspirations were still higher. He briefly went off to Egypt and discovered a bunch of gnarly Egyptian stuff, but then the British destroyed his fleet and trapped his forces. Say, Napoleon, sir, you're not going to leave us here stuck in Egypt and return oh, to no, France, never are do you? That. Nonsense, no, my boy. Never. I would never dream of abandoning my loyal soldiers. Wow, what's that over there? On his return to Paris, Napoleon found himself to be extremely popular and the government extremely unpopular, and he started getting some power-hungry ideas. Conveniently, a politician named Emmanuel Joseph Sieyès approached Napoleon and said, Hey man, since you're so popular, do you want to help me stage a coup? Great idea. Let's stage a coup, and then I'll coup you. <laughs> what? Napoleon? I'll probably get into that in the Napoleon video, so I won't talk too much on that. That one's coming up next, by the way. But yeah, it was obviously a little bit more than that. But With the help of his politician brother, entered the government chamber, possibly got punched in the face, and finally his troops intimidated the council to dissolve the government and his create a new constitution that basically made Napoleon a dictator. So there you have it. The French Revolution, born with the great promise of liberty and equality. The common people dared challenge an oppressive system that had existed for centuries. But before they knew it, they found liberty sidelined by terror, equality that possibly didn't quite hit the mark, and an absolute monarchy replaced by an absolute dictator. Napoleon began stabilizing French society. Yep. He restored the Catholic Church and got rid of that crazy calendar, among other things. But he remained ever ambitious. 
you I mean, among other things, I mean, again, we'll get into it in the Napoleon video, but possibly the most influential French figure of all time, maybe even the most influential European figure of all time. It's just, yeah, we'll get into it. He was France's first consul, but he slept soundly at night dreaming of being something even bigger. Napoleon's oh, expansionist aspirations, combined with the ongoing conflict in Europe, would eventually lead the continent into a huge conflict known today as Fantastic. Cool. Well, yep, spoilers. Uh, next video coming up is going to be Napoleon. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. I thought that was a fantastic little recap of the French Revolution. It's always sad that when revolutions that start with really good ideas end up going and, you know, pretty much becoming the thing that they swore to destroy, right? What's that Batman quote? Either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Thank you all very much for joining me. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care. And I will see you guys in the next video.